Hello and welcome to topic four, lecture two. And in this lecture, we're gonna take a look at the sociological theories of crime. So the last theory that we're gonna be taking a look at in lectures is the sociological theories. And from their viewpoint, that criminals are a product of society, that society produces, creates criminals, um, that people are not born naturally criminal. And you can see just as the rational choice theory dovetails nicely with the crime control um, perspective uh, that you'll see that the sociological theories um, dovetail nicely with the rehabilitation perspective that we learned about. So sure, maybe engaging in crime is a rational choice. Maybe it's also has something to do with one's biology. Um, but maybe there are social factors or societal factors that help us understand criminality as well. And sociological theories focus on the role that society plays in criminal behavior. So there are two main branches within the sociological theory of crime. The first branch is known as social structure theory. And what social structure theory focuses on is the, the impact of poverty on cr criminal behavior. And so from the social structure theory, and we're gonna look at the sub theories within social structure theory in a second, that they say that crime is a byproduct of poverty. And that when you have high poverty areas, that those high poverty areas create conditions that support and produce criminality. Okay, and I, we'll look at the sub theories within that in a second. Social process theory takes a different approach. They say that the root cause of crime cannot be found solely in poverty. They're not saying that poverty doesn't have some impact, but they say that it's not the only impact that um, that it's not the only uh, cause for criminal behavior. Uh, they say that interpersonal interactions and relationships also influence behavior and that, that depending on the type of interpersonal interactions and relationships that you have to people in society, that those relationships can support criminal behavior or on the flip side, those relationships can diminish those criminal behaviors and in fact push people towards so-called pro-social behaviors. Um, and so from the social process theory, they think that criminality is a product of so socialization. And so let's take a look at the uh, both of these branches in detail and the sub theories that are included in each of these branches. So social structure theory argues that criminal criminality is a byproduct of poverty. Um, and as your textbook points out that, you know, we have a relatively high level of poverty in the United States, given the fact that we're an advanced industrial democratic nation. When you compare our, our level of poverty to other countries like ours, we have a relatively high level of poverty. Um, that we also have a tremendous gap, a very high gap between uh, the rich and the poor in the country as well. And so, as your textbook points out, that the median household income is about sixty-two thousand, about sixty-one thousand dollars a year. But that those who are in the top one percent make about eight times that, with a, a median household income of thirty-nine, three hundred and ninety thousand uh, dollars. We also know that there's racial disparities within wealth and income as well. And so that while the um, the median household income for a white family is about sixty thousand dollars the median household income for a black family is $35,000, okay? Uh, and so, you know, that, uh, you know, we have um, uh, areas uh, in the United States, particularly in urban areas, but in rural areas as well, that experience a high level of poverty. And that um, the thinking from this uh, perspective is that because of the impact that poverty has on society, that, um, that, that the impact that it has creates conditions to um, uh, produce and create uh, criminal behavior. Uh, one thing they point to is the social disorganization that's associated with poverty. And so they say that crime is a product of the poor transitional neighborhoods that are disorganized and plagued with economic problems and that this disorganization makes the areas um, uh, ripe and prime for crime. Uh, and so, like, like I said, I live in River West, okay, which um, is, uh, it's not an area that has a tremendously high level of poverty, right, but it's probably more in the median income level. 
just to the east of us is the east side with it where there is a lot of a higher level of wealth and income and just west of us is a very it's a really sort of very poor areas within milwaukee and when you drive around in this area you really notice the difference between the east side which is wealthy and the houses are large and well tended and you don't see a lot of boarded up houses right the the yards look nice they're well tended to and that's a product of having more income when you have more income when you have more money you're able to own your home and take care of it uh you know west of us uh you know is an area of high poverty and when you drive around in that that area you could see that the poverty the, the low level of of income the low level, the high level of poverty you can see it play itself out in the neighborhood um, that most of the people who live in those neighborhoods rent, not all, but most rent. And when you're a renter, you don't have as much control of your property. Things might be broken. The house, the, the grass may not be mowed because you're dependent on the landlord doing those things. And if the landlord doesn't do those things then they don't get done, windows don't get fixed, pipes don't get uh, repaired. Uh, the house is intended to. Also, if it's not your property, you have a lower incentive. And oftentimes if you're renting, you might have a lower level of income and you don't have the income necessary to take take care of uh, of the property in the way that you might want to. Also, you know, you drive around in poor areas and you have a higher level of foreclosed homes. And so your home could be, or where you're living, your rental unit could be right next to on one side and then the other, boarded up houses with the green boarded up windows. And those uh, boarded up houses are, are, are ripe areas for crime because it's like they're abandoned and nobody's paying attention to what's going on there. And so those are just some of the examples of sort of the disorganization that comes from poor neighborhoods. Uh, also, if people who are, uh, have a higher level of poverty are just basically sometimes one, one step away from um, the, the disorganization that comes from poverty. And so you, when, you're, when you have a lower level income, you have less money to save. So that if your car breaks down, chances are you're not going to buy a new car, but a used car, higher level of it breaking down, breaks down, and that could obliterate any meager savings that you might have. And you, and you may not even be able to repair it because you don't have the savings. The car is broken. You can't get to the job. You lose your job. And it becomes this dominoes effect of that, disorgan that social disorganization. Um, and so, you know, basically that, uh, you know, the, this, this viewpoint says that when neighborhoods are, are, are riddled with poverty, uh, that it leads to social disorganization. And social disorganization makes it much easier for uh, people to, uh, that so, uh, people who are raised in socially disorganized areas are more likely to be, be involved in criminal activity because they're more likely to see the criminal activity that arises from that social disorganization. Um, they also talk about this thing called the po culture of poverty. And the culture of poverty is that when uh, oftentimes uh, uh, that, uh, you know, if you have the means to get out of a poor area, you will get out of the poor area. But if you don't have the means to get out of a poor area, you stay in the poor area. So you have sort of clusters of people who have high levels of poverty living in kind of dense areas that are sort of disconnected from other parts of the city. And the culture of poverty is, uh, you know, argues that people who are live in poverty create sort of a separate society or separate norms that conflict with the mainstream values and norms. And a lot of times that this can be a uh, sort of a response to a, a, like trying to protect yourself uh, from the things that you don't have, that you don't experience because you're living in a poorer area. So, you know, when you live in poverty, it's that, that, that area can be part uh, of uh, uh, like uh, uh, marked by apathy, cynicism, a, a help of a sense of distrust, of the broader community because it's like how come the broader community doesn't care about us or try to help lift us out of poverty like you might feel abandoned and sort of like that the american dream is sort of like a myth and that when you have that sort of helplessness then when you look at mainstream values like hey if you get a good job then you can you know make money and then you'll rise up in the corporate structure or if you work hard and you go to school then you'll get good grades and then that will result in getting a better job a lot of times you sort of feel like that's not going to happen for you and so that you might create from this theory this um this separate culture that sort of um uh, 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 rejects mainstream values, sort of sees that, you know, getting a job is for losers. There's better ways of making money through a criminal endeavor. Um, going to school is for losers. Why waste your time? Because it's not going to get you anywhere. So why don't you turn to criminal activities that are going to be more able to allow you to survive? 
Uh, and then they also talk about the concept of strain. And so the concept of strain is that when you grow up in poverty, when you live in poverty, you still may want to uh, uh, adopt the goals of conventional society. Um, you might want to get an education and then go to college, right? Graduate from high school, go to college, get a good job. Uh, you might feel like if you get an education, that's going to lead to a better job. You might want to get married, right? Um, get a job, make some money, then get married and raise a family. Strain is that you want to adopt these conventional goals, but because of poverty that people face frustration. Um, and that you get, you, you know, that you go to every day to high school, but your high school is so disorganized and underfunded that you're not learning anything, that there's more people, you know, uh, uh, behavioral problems, teachers having to keep people in line and less learning going on. You might have the, the training you need, but that unemployment it would be, could very well be uh, very high in your area or the good jobs aren't in your neighborhood. And so you've got to, you know, use a car, ride, use a bus to get to the job, right? And that can be exhausting, particularly if you don't have a car and you have to depend on public transportation, which could take hours out of your day. And so you want to achieve these goals, but you get really frustrated and because you're not able to achieve those goals. And from this perspective, from this theory, they say that that frustration results in anger and that and that anger can result to, in antisocial behavior, just like kind of saying, screw it. I tried I as hard as I can. I, I can't make it, this work. I'm not achieving these mainstream goals. I'm frustrated and I'm going to turn to antisocial or criminal behavior instead. And this is a graph from your textbook that shows, I'm not actually sure it's in this edition, but whether it is or not, here it is for you, um, that uh, it, it's a nice graph of strain, like or a illustration of strain. So on the one side, and let me put on my magic uh, pen here, you know, so it's sort of like these are the sources of strain that you might have a, jo a goal of graduating from high school or going to college or getting a good job and that you fail to achieve that goal. Um, there might be a disjuncture, disjuncture between the expectations that you have and the achievements that you're able to make. And so you might say, you know, I'm really, really going to work really hard to, you know, do well in college this semester and I'm doing my hardest, but I'm facing all of these barriers to achieving that. I don't have the money to get the textbooks or, um, you know, you know, like my computer broke and I don't have the money to buy a new one. Wi-Fi in my apartment went out, you know, that I, I'm homeless. I lost my place to live. And so you want to achieve these things, but you can't achieve these things. And that results in frustration um, that you might not have a lot of positive stimuli or somebody who is giving you uh, a person who is giving you positive stimuli might be removed from your life. Um, you know, later on, we'll talk about the impact of incarceration and having parents removed from home because of incarceration. And they could have been a positive influence and now they're gone and they're not, no one's there to hold the family together. Uh, and you might be presented with neg negative stimulus, you know, not having your positive role models, having more negative role models. Uh, and then, you know, they say that these sorts of things uh, result in um, negative affective states, as they say, anger, disappointment, d depression, fear, because you don't have the positive stimuli anymore and you're presented with like criminality in your neighborhood right and that that these are the emotional states and that these emotional states can lead to that antisocial behavior um drug abuse because you're depressed um that delinquency because you feel frustrated violence because you are you know um having anger uh, you might feel like nothing matters and you drop out of school or you quit your job okay so this is one of the social um, uh, social theories, uh, social structure theories uh, that strain that I think does uh, you know provide this graph provides a nice uh, uh, illustration of that concept. Okay, so let's look at the other branch of sociological theory, which is the social process theories, and from their perspective, that criminality is a product of socialization, not just poverty. Um, they're not saying that poverty doesn't play a role in the production of criminal behavior, but they say that poverty in and of itself is not enough to explain the impact that society has on creating criminals. In fact, many people grow up in poverty that don't become criminals. So what else is going on in society that produces criminals? Um, the first theory or sub theory within social process theories is social learning theory. And like the title suggests that the way people become 
learn criminal or the way people become criminals is because they learn criminal behavior from their relationships, their social relationships, relationships with their family, relationships with their peers, and even relationships with the community and the neighborhood that they live in. And so, for example, adolescence, as you know, you move from being a child into an adolescent or you're beginning to make decisions about your behavior, right, and choices, um, that adolescents can be taught the attitudes, values, and behaviors that support or don't support criminality, okay? Um, and so if you are an adolescent who is around a lot of family members that have an attitude that crime is like the way to get ahead, have values that, um, you know, that the only way you are going to make money is by not, you know, do, do engaging in like drug dealing rather than like getting a job at McDonald's or whatever. Um, uh, you know, and if, and if you're seeing behaviors of people engaging in crimes without like the community um, or the family condemning that, then you learn, you get, you learn a message and the, and the message is that the, these people commit crimes, these people, you know, value it. Um, and so I'm gonna model my behavior after what I'm seeing within my family and my peer groups. Um, and so uh, younger people model their behavior after the violent and criminal acts that they see adults and also their peers engaging in. And so if, if they're, uh, uh, the, the adults around them or the peers around them are engaging in violent or criminal actions and people are like, go for it, that you're, what it means to be like a man or whatever is to be violent. And if that violence is celebrated rather than condemned, then behavior is going to be modeled after that. Um, and so from this perspective, if you want to change criminal behavior, then change that social learning that you can teach ch ch uh, student children um, that, uh, that um, you know, crime is wrong, violence is wrong. And so you can, if you, society can socialize, can, you know, do social learning in order to produ produce um, law abiders, uh, those who will engage in pro-social behavior rather than anti-social behavior. Another um, uh, uh, sub-theory within social process theory is what's known as social control theory. And this is a neat theory in that it basically says that everybody has the potential to be a criminal or everyone has the potential to be like, like a pro-social you know, actor engaging in um, behaviors that support society rather than um, like bring society down. But that whether or not you become a criminal or not depends on the social bonds that you have with others within society. And so they're basically saying that every individual is sort of tethered through their social bonds that they have with people in their community. That they are, the stronger your bond is to your family, the stronger your bond is to your, your, your school, your teachers, the stronger your bond is with your in place where you work, the stronger your bond is to church, the stronger the bond is even to your country, right? Any of these strong bonds that you have that you don't want to disappoint the people that you have bonds with, right? And so the stronger those bonds are, the more you're going to want to follow the rules, right? And be a good social actor. But when you don't have those strong bonds, when you don't have a good bond with your family, with your, when you don't have a good bond with your teachers or a place of employment, you don't have anyone to let down. Nobody's looking out for you. Nobody's keeping you into account. And so those, those frayed um, uh, uh, bonds that we have society can actually lead to somebody saying, screw it, I'm not gonna follow the rules. I am going to engage in, in, um, in criminal behavior because um, there's nobody that really is keeping me to account. And then the final um, theory that we're gonna look at, we have two graphs to go with social control and social reaction theory is labeling theory. And we talked about this theory when we were talking about the non-interventionist perspective. In this theory, they're basically saying that the view that, um, that criminals are created because they're stigmatized and they get a label and that label becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and so let's take a look at these two um, graphs that illustrate social control theory and social reaction theory to get a, a better understanding of each of these theories. Okay, so this is a graph, okay? And that basically shows like that you have this criminal behavior here and that you have the conforming or pro-social behavior, right? The non-criminal behavior following the social rules and in, in, in order. And that you have an individual, right? And, and so the individual like um, it has emotions, right? And so they have attachments to people. They have commitments to people, people that they don't want to let down. They have certain beliefs and they have certain involvements. And that the stronger your attachments are to your family, friends, and community, that 
if you don't come home for dinner, your mom says, where the heck were you? If your friends are like, hey, we were going to go out and do something and you didn't show up, like, like we care about you, what's wrong, right? The stronger those attachments are, the more likely <clears throat> you are to, um, you know, uh, have behavior that follows social norms, like positive, you know, you'll, you'll say, I'm sorry that I didn't come home for dinner. You know, I'm sorry I let you guys down. It's good to know somebody's looking out for me, right? You have these same sorts of co uh, commitments that to family, like you're supposed to do chores. You didn't do them. You let us down. You have a commitment to achieving future goals, uh, beliefs that honesty matters, that there's a sense of being a fair, that people should be treated fairly, um, that, that you, you know, have this commitment to that you should be responsible. If you say you're going to do something, do it. And that you have these involvements that you have strong bonds with. So they're saying that the stronger these bonds are, the more likely you are to engage in pro-social behavior. But when those bonds to your involvements, to the beliefs, your values, um, you, your commitments to family and the attachments that you have to your friends and community, when those are frayed, then it's like nobody, you don't care anymore, right? Like um, no, you, you're not involved in a sports team. So you have, you know, you don't have anyone to like, you know, work with and be with on a, on a goal um, that you're like, screw it. It doesn't matter whether you do the right thing, you know, all, all of this. When, and, and when you have that attitude, then you're more likely to uh, violate social norms. Okay. Now do keep in mind that <clears throat> these attachments, commitments, and beliefs, involvement, a lot of that is impacted by poverty. So if you grow up in a poorer area, it could very well be that there are less community organizations, less school activities. It could very well be that your commitment to your family is frayed um, because your family might be super busy working a lot of low wage jobs or they um, you know, might not uh, you know, be actually like um, able to follow through on, hey, where were you? you? Didn't show up for dinner because they might be depressed and despondent from experiencing poverty and un unemployment. So it's not that poverty doesn't matter. It Im can impact and have a fraying effect on those social bonds. And uh, this graph just shows you the labeling process, okay? So I'll, I'll let you take a look at that, but it's, it's really good. It's in your textbook. It talks about sort of how you have this initial criminal act that takes place, and then, um, then you get this label, and then you sort of accept this label, and then you make good on that label, right? You get labeled a criminal, and then you start acting like a criminal, okay? So it's a good graph to take a look at to um, get a better understanding of the, the, this, uh, the labeling theory. Okay, so I just want to leave you with um, uh, a, a suggestion for a documentary to watch, and this is just totally optional. Uh, but there is a link to this documentary in Topic 4 module, and it's a documentary called The Interrupters. And it is a great documentary to watch, um, uh, in particular because it illustrates the, the, both the social structure and the social process theory that we just learned about. This is a 2010 documentary made by Steve James, um, and it tells the story of three violence interrupters who work in Chicago. And, um, you know, what they, these are a former, these violence interrupters are former gang members. And that they um, have been, uh, their job is to basically interrupt the violence that is taking place between gangs within Chicago. And it just, uh, it, it's a part of the ceasefire program um, in Chicago that's had relatively good success with reducing violence within Chicago. Um, and so it, it just chronicles these uh, individuals who are really trying to break um, some of the social learning that goes on and um, address some of the strain that people in poor areas are ex uh, experiencing and having it not um, express itself in antisocial criminal behavior. And the individual there, her name is uh, Amina Matthews, and she's the star of the show. And um, you know, she's uh, the daughter of a, a famous gang leader from Chicago. His name was Jeff Ford, and she, you know, was uh, 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 and got involved in gangs herself. And she has a felony conviction. She changes her life around, and that she dedicates her life to interrupting violence on the streets of Chicago. So I really want to encourage you to watch it. It's a great documentary, and it really does a great job of illustrating these concepts that you just learned about. All right, thanks a lot for listening. I appreciate it, and I'll talk to you again soon.